Good evening, everybody. Um, I'd like to uh, call to order the Monday, April 1st meeting of the Quincy City Council Environmental and Public Health Committee. Uh, and call it to order. Madam Clerk, can you call the roll? Council Devona. Council Liang. Present. Council Mahoney. Council McCarthy. Yeah, yeah. Chairman Harris. Here. Yeah. You have a quorum. You have a quorum. Very good. Um, uh, first off, um, Matters before the council. Um, first, I should do the open meeting. You should. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Open meeting law. Pursuant to the open meeting law, any person may make an audio or video recording of this public meeting or may transmit the meeting through any medium. Attendees are therefore advised that such recordings or transmissions are being made, whether perceived or unperceived, by those present and are uh, deemed acknowledgeable and permissible. And with that, I also would like to thank um, QATV, who has, um, is, is televising this this evening. Um, normally, they, they don't do uh, all of the uh, committee meetings, but this one has such a um, an in, large impact on, on uh, several communities. Um, the Native American communities, as well as the communities in Quincy. So, again, I'd like to thank uh, QATV. So, with that, I would like to uh, introduce that this is where on 2019-045 resolution seeking testimony from Native American organizations regarding preservation of burial in. Indian burial ground on Long Island. So with that, I would like to introduce uh, and invite to speak Gary McCann, policy consultant of the MICDI Policy um, Intertribal Committee on Dare Island. And um, please, always good to see you, Gary. Yes, nice to see you, Chairman. So uh, we're going to start out, we have a number of speakers, and we're going to start out with uh, Chairman Ken White from the Chabon Nagongamog Nipmuc Tribe, and he'll be our first speaker, followed by a number of other speakers. Excellent. If, if that's okay. Oh, that, maybe that'd be begin. wonderful. Yes. All right. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. So if you could just come up and uh, say a name and uh, speak into the microphone so everybody can hear you, that'd be great. Uh, thank you. For, uh, I'm not used to being on TV. So, uh, My name is Ken White. I'm chairman of the uh, Nipmuc Indian Council of Shabanda Gungamog. Uh, we're from the Webster Dudley area of Massachusetts. And we're one of the uh, uh, state acknowledged uh, Nipmuc tribes of Massachusetts. Um, I want to thank uh, uh, Quincy Mayor Koch, I hope I pronounced that right. Close enough. Uh, and the Quincy City Council, and uh, NACOB, of course, for the invitation to give te testimony at this hearing. I want to make it very clear that the Nipmuc Indian Council of Shibuna Gungamog neither supports or opposes the proposed bridge construction to Long Island. Our concerns over the possible construction of facilities on Long Island that would require extensive excavation that could result in the desecration of unmarked Native American burials. Our tribe has long been an advocate of the protection of Native American burials. History tells us that during King Philip's War, Native Americans from internment areas within the mainland praying Indians, were forcibly removed to Deer Island with nothing but the clothing that they were wearing. These poor souls were subject to deplorable conditions at these concentration camps, where many died of sickness, little food, and were buried on the island. Many more were sold as slaves, while hundreds were moved to nearby Long Island, where there may be unmarked burial sites. 
there as well. These concentration camps was an attempted systematic genocide of a human race. If indeed there is future construction and excavations on Long Island, the Shabandagangabang Indian Council supports a full archaeological survey be conducted to detect unmarked burials that may be associated with the Long Island concentration camps. Our ancestors' right to die with dignity was inhumanely taken from them. This survey is the honorable thing to do in order to preserve their final resting place or be reinterred with honor and dignity that they so rightfully deserve. Boston has come a long way in cleaning up the waters of Boston Harbor and the islands. However, the city of Boston has failed to recognize the dark history of these islands. A better education is key to the early history of Boston and the Harbor Islands and should be taught at the elementary level in all Massachusetts U.S. history courses. But very little is known of the inhumane treatment of Native Americans in the colonial era of Massachusetts Bay. Now, could you took them? I have spoken. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions for the speaker? Thank you very much Thank for you, your Jim. testimony. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome. Thank you very much. And good evening to uh, the esteemed representatives of the city of Quincy, Massachusetts Office of the Council. My name is Wanamwa Tom Frederick. I am the second chief of the Chappaquiddick tribe of Massachusetts Wampanoag Nation and board director of North American Indian Center of Boston. I've been invited to speak today and give testimony on behalf of the joint collaborations of the Mahiganok Intertribal Committee on Deer Island and the former established Boston Indian Council now referred to as North American Indian Council or NACOP. As you all are well aware, Long Island and Boston Harbor is the site of a horrendous event as it was used as a concentration camp for the Indians in 1676 during the King Philip's Wars. My people, my tribe, have a special vested interest as to the importance of these actions. Simply put, these are my ancestors. Not just simply bones, but names. Tumpum, Tuspaquin, Hayano, Sikonet, Sassamon, and later Freeman, Frederick, Simpson, these are just to name a few. As a direct descendant, I ask you to mitigate these actions with compassion. This is an opportunity to take steps to right a wrong that should have never happened. Will this government continue to heap insult upon injury? And can this government establish humanity by validating the remains of a marginalized and oppressed people? This is not just an opportunity for urban development, but a mandate for justice. As I have mentioned today, these bones have names. I can only think about the sadness and the pain that many of the family members experienced on the island. Elderly women, children, forced to experience cold, Today, let there be a voice at a crucial time that seems to celebrate separatism in our nation and in our government. And I ask you to impart the same compassion and grace that was granted to your ancestors as they were laid to rest in well-maintained, manicured, hallowed grounds. 
I proposed the creation of an on-site Native American committee that can oversee the proper care and handling of Indian remains, both from a cultural, spiritual, and ethical vantage. Said committee may operate as an advisor in pride mediation with an emphasis on cultural sensitivity and others as specified by tribal traditions. Please hear me. The words I speak are not here to pass judgment on anyone, but your actions today will determine if this nation has learned from its past. No, we are not the progenitors of the past, but we are certainly the history makers of the future. What will our legacy be? What will the message we leave for our generations to come? In short, I leave you with these words to assist you in this monumental decision that you must make. The hurt of one is the hurt of us all, yet the honor of one is the honor of us all. In our way, this is what it means to walk in beauty, to walk in peace. In our words, as Nutanian, please remember, we are still here. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Any, is there any questions for, any questions, folks, no? I, I thank you for coming. Good evening, welcome. Good evening, thank you. Good evening. My name is Lauren Sampson. I'm a civil rights attorney at Lawyers for Civil Rights, formerly the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights and Economic Justice. Founded at the behest of President John F. Kennedy and Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy, Lawyers for Civil Rights has spent 50 years engaging in creative, collaborative, and courageous legal advocacy on behalf of immigrants and people of color. From desegregating Boston's public schools to representing sanctuary cities in litigation against the federal government, LCR has responded to the needs of various communities of color in their quest for representation, visibility, and justice. LCR is proud to stand with the MICDI, MNC, Tribal, and First Nations governments in fighting for the preservation of the Deer Island, Long Island, and Boston Harbor, Boston Harbor Island's historical concentration campsites and burial ground sites. We have a historical relationship with MICDI. In the 1990s, Ozell Hudson, the former executive director of LCR, represented the MICDI when the Massachusetts Water Resources Authority built a sewage treatment plant on Deer Island without, in violation of federal law, considering the tribe's concerns that the government ignored the burial grounds on the island. These burial grounds were the result of concentration and internment camps that held native peoples during King Philip's War in the 1600s. Indigenous people who did not consent to be converted in praying towns or assimilated in white settlements were progressively marginalized. Despite this history, at a 1993 meeting with the EPA, our office was shocked to hear an EPA official say that proper sewage was just more important than old Indian burial grounds. Today, nearly 30 years later, the tribal governments are once again fighting for recognition of the genocide of their people. The city of Boston is pushing forward with a development project to construct a new bridge to Long Island in the harbor without sufficient consideration of the history of that island through an extensive environmental impact statement. Of course, the tribes are not opposed to infrastructural improvements or to the addiction treatment planned for that center. But in this day and age, the future does not have to come at the expense of the past. It is possible to appropriately acknowledge sites of memory. Our history is not just statues of colonists and explorers. It is also the pain and trauma they cause to residents of this region. Commemorating the non-combatant elderly women and children who lived and died here during early co conflicts with colonists is not polemic. It's simply an acknowledgement of the truth and of our shared responsibility. LCR is pleased that the city of Quincy is seeking a new state environmental impact statement to properly assess the ramifications of the proposed development. We urge the city to partner and continue to partner with the MICDI governments in ensuring that all voices can be heard during this process to prevent the erasure of this particular part of our shared history. Thank you. Have any um, questions? Thank you very much for testifying.
Good evening and welcome. Thank you, good evening. Um, before I get started, I'd just like to ask permission from the Native Elders um, to speak. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> good evening to the um, council members and the uh, Quincy residents that are here. My name is Danielle DeLuca. I work with an organization called Cultural Survival, which is based in Cambridge, Mass. Um, I'm not a resident of Quincy myself, but I come from a long line of DeLucas uh, who had lived in Quincy for three generations, um, the over on Bunker Hill Lane. So I appreciate the opportunity to speak here tonight. Cultural Survival is a nonprofit um, that works to implement the rights of indigenous peoples. I was asked here uh, to testify by Gary McCann. Uh, we do not take a particular stance on the bridge like many others have mentioned, uh, but we are interested in this opportunity for tribal members in the area to be consulted on the issue since it has impacts for Native communities today. Here in Massachusetts, we are done a disservice in our education system by failing to acknowledge the deep history of policies of genocide that were enacted by the colonial governments here, um, primarily during King Philip's War, and which have continued for generations. The internment of Native Americans in Boston Harbor Islands is an example of that uh, policy of genocide. And I think the question of development on Long Island provides an opportunity for us to reckon with that history in a public way and to educate our fellow citizens on the rich cultures and histories of local Native American tribes. As the advocacy program manager for cultural survival, my role is to work towards implementing the human rights of indigenous peoples. And these human rights enshrined by the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples were endorsed by the US government in 2007. And so the US government on the federal, regional, and local levels has an obligation to uphold those rights. So I briefly just want to mention a few specific human rights that I think are relevant here. Um, these are basic human rights that Native communities are due. Article 12 of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples states that um, Indigenous peoples have the right to manifest, practice, develop, and teach their spiritual and religious traditions, customs, and ceremonies, the right to maintain, protect, and have access in privacy to their religious and cultural sites, the right to use and control their ceremonial objects, the right to the repatriation of their human remains. Um, states shall seek to enable and access, enable the access and or repatriate ceremonial objects and human remains in their possession through fair, transparent, and effective mechanisms developed in conjunction with indigenous peoples concerned. Article 19 provides the following. States shall consult and cooperate in good faith with the indigenous peoples concerned through their own representative institutions in order to obtain their free prior and informed consent before adopting and implementing legislation or administrative measures that may affect them. In addition to these standards, in US federal law, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act protect, protects Native American burial sites when any federal funds are being used and provides best practices that should be followed by cities and towns as well. I hope that the cities of Quincy and Boston can take these minimum standards into account when engaging with the human remains that exist on Long Island and take this opportunity to engage tribes in the area with the goal of seeking their free prior and informed consent before any further projects take place that will affect these important historical sites. Uh, it's really important to actively seek participation from and include local tribes in decision making that involves the remains of their ancestors, so I thank you for providing the space for that to happen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any no questions. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you so much. Good evening and welcome. Thank you. My name is Gareth Howling Crane. I'm Cheyenne Pawnee from the, the North America Indian Center of Boston. Uh, I would like to speak on behalf of the uh, Munsee Delaware Nation out of Ontario. Uh, dear city council members, on behalf of the chief and council and members of the Muncie Delaware Nation, I would like to thank you all for the serious concern you are taking towards the Indian burial grounds on Long, Long Island. Our ancestors, at our ancestors once occupied and were responsible for extensive lands in the present states of Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and New York. We have long been involved in efforts to respect and memorialize the tragic history of our ancestors' connection to both Deer Island and Long Island. 
These efforts have included other tribes from the Northeast, and together we speak for those who no longer have a voice. Over the centuries, the progress of civilization has resulted in the obliteration of our sacred sites and burial grounds. We, where such sites still exist, we must make all efforts to preserve and memorialize this importance. We appreciate your offer to appear at your council members and meetings to discuss this matter, but are unable to do so at this time. However, we are hoping that there will be further opportunities to take part in discussions as to this, just what can be done to honor the mem memories of those who perished at Long Island. Sincerely, Mark Peters, Muncie, Delaware Nation. And I would like to thank you that you all for the opportunity. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you so much. Thanks. So I'm going to be um, making some comments on behalf of Chief Rick, Richard Obubzwin of the, from the Grand Council of the Wabanaki Nation, who could not be here but has asked me to fill in. And I just thought I'd reiterate comments made by the um, Joint Council. The uh, Wabanaki uh, Grand Council is composed of the Odenak Abenaki Nation and the Wallenak Abenaki Nation in Quebec, Canada. And um, they have sent correspondence to the city of Boston. And so that's relevant, certain points, the policy points that they would like made. So just to have this as part of the public record, I thought I'd read um, from their correspondence to the city of Boston. The Wabanaki Nation is a participant government in the Mohicanu National Confederacy, the MNC, and the Mohicaniak Intertribal Committee on Deer Island, or MICDI. Our government has been involved in and supportive of the work of preserving Deer Island and other MNC issues since February 1992, and our government and the governments of the Lunapi Lakwi Delaware Nation Council and the Six Nations Council have reaffirmed our past support and have appointed representatives to coordinate information and communication relating to our interest on these issues. The Nadakina Office Director of the Grand Council of the Weban Aki Nation, Susie Obamsawan, has appointed, been appointed by our government to coordinate with the MICDI MNC governments and to communicate our interests relating to the Weban Aki Nation in Boston and elsewhere. The government of the Weban Aki Nation is supportive of the of MICDI policies, including A the repatriation of Deer Island to federal Indian trust status. B, the repatriation of the native um, burial ground on Long Island as described by the Massachusetts state archeologist in 1992 from the concentration camp period of 1676 to federal Indian trust status. Three, the memorial of the First Nations on Deer Island in Boston Harbor, as promised by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts in 1991 to the First Nations as directed through a consultation process as described by the MICDI Indian Community Meetings Proposal. At point D, implementation of the MICDI Community Meetings Proposal as supported by numerous BCRs, which are Band Council Resolutions, and by a resolution of the Assembly of First Nations, AFN, and the National Congress of American Indians, NCAI. Point uh, uh, number five E, the MICDI Joint Educational Initiative requiring Native history, including that of Deer Island, to be taught on a secondary level in public schools in Massachusetts. Um, so uh, I, on behalf of the uh, government of the Wabanaki 
nation. They're glad that uh, Councillor Harris is opening this opportunity to present before the government of the city of Quincy the concerns of their nations and the other nations that are present here. So thank you. Thank you. Um, any questions for um, Gary? Thank you for everything that you do, Gary. Thank you. So hello, my name is uh, Jean-Luc Perit. I am a member of the Tunica Biloxi tribe of Louisiana, which is federally recognized, um, based out of uh, Marksville, uh, Louisiana, um, where my family does language and culture preservation work. And uh, here locally, I'm president of the board of directors at the North American Indian Center of Boston. Now, you may think that Louisiana Indian, like me, what do I have to say about any of this? And I, I just want to say that it's, you know, as I've been doing the work here that I've, that I've done with the North American Indian Center of Boston, I've come to find that what happens here in Massachusetts spirals out and impacts not only the rest of the United States, um, but the First Nations uh, in Canada as well. I'm also uh, very aware of the impacts of having your ancestors' graves be desecrated. 10 years before I was born, an amateur archeologist excavated one of our ancestral Tunica villages. He took the, what was then called the largest cache of Native American trade goods, human remains, and so forth, and, uh, and eventually leased it to Harvard uh, Peabody Museum, where it stayed. We didn't repatriate this, um, all of these sacred objects and human remains until 20 years after the fact. Um, and so I, 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 I saw what my family went through. I saw what my grandfather went through as our first tribal chairman, um, not only to get a state recognition and then to get us federal recognition, because in the United States, if you don't have these tools of recognition or you have some other stumbling block that your community falls upon, you can be deemed not the legal heirs of your ancestors' bones. So I'm very thankful for all of the things that my grandfather and his generation went through, not only to get us recognition status, but to repatriate those human remains and sacred objects. But it didn't have to happen because they could have stayed in the ground. Those graves didn't need to be desecrated. So now here I am. North American Indian Center of Boston, Combined History of Boston Indian Council. We've been here for 50 years. And in August 2017, we reaffirmed our collaboration with MICDI, MNC. Our organization was des designated as a liaison for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts for resident members of tribes outside of the current borders who have historical government-to-government -government relationships such as the Mahicano National Confederacy. This was done by the executive order of Governor Michael Dukakis in 1976. On February 29, 1992, it was at NACOB that MNC was historically reestablished with the creation of the Confederacy Council. MICDI was also created at that meeting to serve as the official representation on all matters concern of concern to MNC regarding Deer Island and, might I say, the Boston Harbor Islands including Long Island. Our elder at NACOB, our elder and community member, John Sam Sapiel of the Penobscot Nation, served as Mahicanu National Confederacy Bureau of Political Affairs Acting Director and Coordinator of MICDI. Sam, as we say, walked on in 2007. He survived by his wife, Shirley Mills, and she is a founding member of the Boston Indian Council, which is a predecessor to NACOB, as I said. It was because of this organizational history that the current board of directors, um, currently represented by um, my colleagues Tom Frederick and Gary Holland Crane, 
we decided to reaffirm our collaboration with MICDI. Broadly, we have supported educational initiatives and fostering cultural awareness. The upcoming hearing with the city of Quint this hearing is our opportunity for our community members and their representative government officials to speak to these concerns. And might I add, um, as my, my colleague Tom Frederick so eloquently put, these aren't just bones um, in soil. They have names that are attached to them. And, um, and we have to do honor to them. So I thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you so much for your testimony. Very well done. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak? I think that's, I think that's it. So with that, uh, would, I'd like to reach out to the counselors and would like to speak, speak their mind. Councilor Yang. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I just wanted to take a moment to thank you for allowing us this opportunity to sit and to listen um, and to learn from all of you. Um, the, the timing of this you know, makes it a little bit more emotional for me, I think, because uh, in the Chinese culture, we always have, particularly around this time of year, um, a celebration where we go to the graves where our, our ancestors are buried and we have sort of a celebration with them. You know, we bring food and there's drinks and we, we celebrate essentially with our ancestors. And so I just did that this weekend um, for my grandparents and it's a lot of fun because you get to see your family members and, and sort of reminisce a little bit and really find a way spiritually to connect with those um, who are no longer with us. And I just, you know, hearing your stories and, and, and you know, the, the bravery you guys have to be open and honest with us here today it is really moving because I couldn't imagine being in the position where you are and not having that opportunity to connect with your ancestors and your family. I mean, that's just, it's heartbreaking. And I want to thank you for coming here tonight um, and really opening our eyes, uh, you know, with, with what's happening right here um, sort of in our neighborhood and, and to share your experiences and your family's history with us. It's, um, it's really moving and it's really important. So I thank you for taking the time to do that. And thank you again, Mr. Chairman, for, for having this hearing tonight. Thank, thank, thank you, Councillor. Councillor McCarthy. Thank you, Harris, um, <clears throat> I also want to thank you all for your testimony. And as a few were up talking, I was just thinking of the cemetery that we have next door here to City Hall and all the history we have and all the preserving that we do in regards to keeping an eye on our ancestors and making sure that um, our cemeteries and other areas are, uh, are well preserved and well taken care of. And I know that uh, Councillor Harris has been um, very involved with Long Island and um, <clears throat> some of the literature here that I've been just going over, um, it's something to be, to be looked at and taken care of. It's, it's land that, um, if it's been touched now, it should remain the way it is out there, but only preserved, uh, just like you folks were talking about your ancestors in that area out there. It shouldn't be a place where the soil's turned up, development happens, etc. cetera. Um, Quincy uh, takes great pride in preserving its ancestry. Um, there's so much here that folks don't know about in the city of Quincy, and folks, a lot, in, period, in the Boston area. And um, you make great points tonight. So uh, you have my support, uh, and I know that I support Councillor Harris in all he's doing with Long Island to keep it the way it is and to make it even better in regards to what you folks want. So thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor McCarthy. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? Yes, Councillor Mahoney. I'm gonna reiterate a little bit about what everybody else had said, but I, I just wanna thank you for coming up as well. Um, because this has been a debate, obviously, Long Island is, we, we, have, we have some concerns here for Quincy as well. But I think through Councillor Harris's leadership, we've been able to open our eyes to multiple reasons why um, we wanna protect that island 
and coming together, joining together, I think our story is getting stronger. So I just wanted to thank you all for coming out and educating us um, because that's really what's happening here tonight. I mean, there's a lot of stories and there's, there's a lot of um, information you provided and heartfelt information, but at the same time, it's also historical and relevant in this world that we live in now when we so often forget um, or can easily forget of what brings us here and how we got here. And obviously it's important that we take care of each other. And I, I really do represent the fact that this, is a, this has been a long, long and hard fought fight for your culture to be able to maintain itself. And it's important that we do and respect it. So I thank you very much for coming out and sharing that with us tonight. So thank you. Thank you, Council Mahoney. Anybody else to speak? With that, then I'm gonna speak. Last but not least, I'm not gonna talk about a bridge. I'm not gonna talk about um, a city to the north of us, but I am gonna talk about what my next step with you folks, and thank you for coming tonight again. I can't thank you enough. At the next council meeting, I will be introducing a resolution, and it's going to be a pretty healthy, long resolution. And it'll have a lot of correspondences from this council to several people. The first group of people that will, I am going to ask this council to correspond to is to the Massachusetts Congressional Delegation, Senator Warren, Senator Markey, and Congressman Lynch, in support of the MICDI Indian Community Meetings proposal, which would require the National Park Service to hold public meetings on each of the reservation communities, as had been done for non-Indian communities, to gather input from tribal members and their governments the means to develop the programs and policies to protect and preserve the Indian burial grounds on the Boston Harbor Islands as required by law. The second correspondence I'll be asking my colleagues who have supported me and have supported you folks is a correspondence seeking an investigation relating to the dumping of human remains in the city of Quincy from Dare Island in September 1994, an intentional effort by the MWRA to, to inquire if there were violations of law in the intentional disposing of human remains from Dare Island in the city of Quincy, possibly to either the district attorney of Norfolk County or the district attorney of Suffolk County. The third correspondence would be to the Massachusetts Advisory Committee of the United States Commission on Civil Rights in support of the MNC proposal of January 2, 2017 for an agreement in principle and leaders summit, particularly calling for an investigation by the Department of Justice together with the support of the offices of the Inspector General of the United States Department of Interior and the Inspector General of the United States Environmental Protection Agency into violations of federal law and federal regulations relating to Dare Island and the Boston Harbor Islands. That will be at the next council meeting, I promise. To be people. Thank you. And thank you all. So with that, without any other testimony, again, my heart's with you all, and I know your heart is with the city of Quincy. So thank you very much. Thank you, folks. That ends this portion of, of uh, we'll take a slight recess, please. What did I say?
Okay, we're back. Um, so, we're on 2019-53, adoption of a five-year multi-hazard mitigation plan. Um, I will um, ask the mayor's office to uh, start us off. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Chairman, if I could. First, before uh, we get into the subject matter, I, on behalf of the mayor, would like to thank you uh, for coordinating the previous session, uh, giving people at home, the community, the ability to, to listen to some of that testimony uh, was obviously very powerful. So uh, on behalf of the mayor, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, before the committee tonight uh, is the update of the city's five-year hazard mitigation plan, uh, which is a requirement under the Federal Disaster Mitigation Act of 2000. So this is a update on uh, a document that we've had now uh, several times over. Um, what it does is it documents historic impacts from natural hazards, things like major storms, flooding, uh, other potential natural uh, hazards that the city faces on a regular basis. It educates the public to the potential danger of these hazards, such as flooding uh, and major storm events, those sorts of things. Um, it is a requirement uh, for much of the uh, federal grant money we get from FEMA uh, to have this plan in place. Uh, for disaster mitigation grants. Um, we have a number uh, that we've applied for in the past. We have a number that we've secured. We have at least one uh, that we're uh, in the process of uh, working on right now. Um, and that's why this document is, is, so, is so vital. Um, and what it does is it sets a framework. It doesn't lock us in to anything. Uh, this is not a, a budget document. This is not uh, a request for any funding for any specific capital project. Uh, what this does uh, is set a framework uh, by outlining um, a number of potential uh, mitigation projects throughout the city uh, and using a various formulas to determine which projects and which neighborhoods uh, the city may be taking a look at. But again, it doesn't set any timetables. It doesn't say this project must be first, this project will be last. It's not asking for your approval on anything. Uh, like that, all it is is setting a guidepost for the city to follow over the next five years so we can have the opportunity uh, to apply for some of these federal grants. Uh, the 2019 plan before you tonight uh, makes a number of improvements over the previous years, most notably uh, this year through in large part the help of a, of a grant, we uh, enlisted the help of a professional engineering firm and tie and bond to help us navigate through this process uh, and really make the document more accessible to the public more readable, um, more viable uh, as, as a living document that sort of highlights all the things that, that are going on and some of the things that we've hi highlighted. Uh, we also have with us tonight uh, Wooded and Karen Joe Shea, who is also helpful in a number of the specific projects that are outlined uh, in uh, the document. Uh, this 2019 plan brings us in line with the 2018 state plan. Uh, it also helps us coordinate with the federal government relative to uh, FEMA grants. As I mentioned, uh, it takes into consideration the effects of a change in climate. Uh, that's another important factor here. Um, this work product that we delivered to this body a couple weeks ago uh, is the result of a lot of hard work. Uh, and that, that hard work was coordinated by Deputy Planning Director Rob Stevens uh, with the assistance of Paul Costello, our city engineer, uh, the team from Time Bond, uh, Dave Murphy, who's not able to be here with us tonight, uh, and Gabrielle Belfit, uh, who will be leading the presentation on the hazard mitigation plan for us tonight. So with that, I, I, I want to, on behalf of the mayor, uh, thank the team that put this together. Uh, it is, is quite a product. Uh, again, it is a, it is a very workable guidepost. Uh, and with that, I would like, with your uh, indulgence, Mr. Chairman, turn it over uh, to Gabrielle for a brief presentation on some of the nuts and bolts of what's in the plan. Yes, please. Welcome, Gabrielle. Thank you very much. Um, good evening. I'm delighted to, to be here and uh, walk you through uh, what went on during the past year putting together the city's hazard mitigation plan. Just let me um, test it. Um, I do want to recognize that we had um, a comprehensive team throughout the city. Um, the offices are listed up there who participated in the review and discussions of multiple sections of the hazard mitigation plan. Um, I see a couple of you have copies of the plan um, on your table. It's also available online through the planning department's website. And um, I'm happy to say there is also a 
eight-page summary of the plan, uh, which I believe, um, is it also on the website? Not yet. So the, um, the eight-page summary uh, for citywide will also be on the planning board's website, as well as a four-page summary of each neighborhood throughout Quincy. So someone who just really wants to focus in on what some of the findings were for their particular area, um, they might find those summaries helpful rather than wading through uh, the hefty document that the plan is. Um, so the reasons um, Chris touched on why the city needed to prepare the plan, it's um, required for the city um, if they want to apply for um, hazard mitigation grants. Um, it's a great way to document uh, historic impacts from the, uh, natural hazards and the vulnerability of areas of town to those hazards. It's a place to memorialize it in a written document. Um, it prioritizes mit mitigation projects, um, and it also helps improve scoring for the community rating system. We found out today, in fact, that um, Quincy's rating system had been improved, it goes down one, the closer you get to one, the better you are. So it's gone from an eight to a seven, which is a great achievement, resulting in lower insurance premiums for homeowners who have uh, national flood insurance. Um, and also it's a great opportunity to educate uh, residents of the town about the risk of natural hazards um, and the benefits of mitigating those hazards so it enables the community to respond and recover more quickly. Um, oops, there we go. So the process is really, it's a four-step process. The first is looking at all of the natural hazards risks that have impacted the city in the past or might be able to impact it in the future. Um, looking across the city to identify those key community assets that would be vulnerable to risk. Um, this is everything from societal uh, community assets to infrastructure to environmental um, community assets and those uh, large economic um, contributors to the Quincy. Um, and then looking at projects that would improve resiliency and prioritizing those for areas that are most at risk. So that's basically the four-step process that we went through. And I'm gonna just touch on each one of those areas quickly. Um, but I do want to mention the process uh, started with uh, drafting the hazard mitigation plan. It was submitted to MEMA um, last December. Um, we presented um, at a planning board, and the planning board voted to send it to MEMA for review. Uh, MEMA quickly uh, approved the plan, sent it to FEMA, and in uh, less than a month, really a matter of weeks, uh, FEMA approved the plan in January conditionally upon adoption by the city. So once the city adopts the plan, it then becomes a, a fully approved um, hazard mitigation plan and grants can be issued. Um, and where we are tonight is that uh, second to the last step, community adopts the final plan. So that is our goal uh, after tonight's presentation uh, to move uh, forward to get the approval to adopt the plan. Um, Chris mentioned uh, those 2008-19 plan improvements. Um, are, this plan is consistent with the 2018 Massachusetts State Hazard Mitigation Plan, which is a great step forward. The 2018 plan, for the first time, incorporated climate change as a natural hazard risk. And Quincy's plan is consistent with the data and the methodologies uh, used in the state plan. Um, and uh, another big benefit is that we looked at natural hazard risk and vulnerability assessments on a geographic base. So we divided the city up into eight geographic planning areas and then we looked at community assets and natural hazards and how they interacted in each one of those geographic planning areas so you could compare and contrast um, from neighborhood to neighborhood. And that we feel that's a very useful update. Um, so here's a view of 
how we broke the city up into the geographic planning areas. It's really watershed based predominantly. Um, we refined some of the lines to correspond uh, to, to roads in major landforms. Um, and it differs a little bit from watersheds uh, at the coastline. Uh, so, um, Quin Quincy has witnessed uh, damage from flooding and rain events um, over years to various degrees. Uh, FEMA repetitive loss data shows storm surge related loss impacts mostly the coastal areas um, as well as inland flooding areas along Furnace Brook. Within the past 10 years alone, Quincy's witnessed 21 coastal flooding events, including record high tides and storm surge. Uh, over the past five years, the city has um, gone through a number of planning studies to better understand the vulnerability to flood events, including how future climate change might worsen this risk and what the city can do to mitigate the impact. Um, Grayson in January uh, broke record high tides um, in Boston Harbor. So that is breaking the 1978 high tide record. And uh, you're well aware of the damages that Riley and Skylar did in the March uh, nor'easters. So as we were developing those plans, those events happened and we revised data and we revised our modeling based on uh, the worst storms happening as we were writing the plan. So that, that was cool. Um, we identified, as I said, all the hazards that could impact Quincy historically or in the future based on the available information to date. And we looked at everything from tsunamis to drought to sea level rise, coastal flooding, ice storms, uh, shoreline changes. And then looking at the significance of each hazard based on the history of occurrence, the geographic extent of impact, economic impact and the likelihood of future occurrence, all the natural hazards were ranked and the highest hazard, it's not really a surprise, uh, coastal and inland flooding, nor'easters, coastal erosion and severe winter weather. So it's not really a surprise. Um, the National Flood Insurance um, is a good indicator of where damages have occurred. Um, repetitive loss and severe repetitive loss claims um, can be mapped. And um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with that terminology, repetitive loss is where there's two or more flood claims on any one proper, property greater than 1,000. And a severe repetitive loss is with four or more separate claims uh, greater than 5,000 or two claims that are greater than the value of the property. Quincy ranks the fifth highest in the state of Massachusetts for repetitive loss claims. Uh, 174 claims, uh, 174 properties um, are listed between 1979 and 1970 with over 540 claims. Um, there's a map there that's showing where those repetitive and severe repetitive loss, loss claims are. And you can see they're predominantly within the 100-year flood zones, um, but they're also uh, located in areas where there's poor drainage that are outside of the flood zones. So we've got the inland flooding predominantly uh, around Furnace Brook. Um, and the, I'm sorry, the coastal ones pre predominantly um, Howes Neck in Germantown in the um, inland or riverine flooding predominantly around Furnace Brook. And as I mentioned, uh, additional areas of flooding occur outside of the 100-year uh, the flood from uh, aging infrastructure and um, the city not being able to keep up with uh, the city's drainage sizing, not being able to keep up with um, development. Uh, since 2013, uh, the city has spent um, over 17 million in drainage improvements, and they have resolved many problems, but that is a big ticket item for them to continue to work on. So, and as you know, um, 
the areas with both coastal and inland flooding are especially impacted by storm surge and high tide, which is pushing up the flood. Um, when stream discharge coincides in the same storm and high tides result in backup of water into the inland drainage networks. Um, the city's addressed that by installing tide gates uh, at over 80 locations. Um, and those tide gates need to be improved and maintained. So just looking uh, at the different ways that uh, Quincy has looked at climate change over the past, um, they used, they looked at a methodology um, based on the Boston Harbor model. Um, they looked at CZM uh, coastal projections and finally at a methodology developed by the state um, from the New England Co Climate Science Center and those are the values that are used in the Mass State Hazard Mitigation Plan. Um, the decision to look at um, 20, uh, 2050, a midterm range, um, was, uh, I'm sorry, the climate change projections go from the, the present up to 2100. Um, our feeling was is that looking that far out to 2100, the climate change science becomes very unpredictable. So we looked at the year 2070 as being the long term um, range. The community asset inventory uh, was done uh, citywide, looking at different categories of people, built environment, natural environment, and the, con and the economy. Um, there's actually a tool online that you can go to and you can look and see where all those community assets are and click on each one, find out the actual um, elevation of that community asset, the owner in the category. Um, uh, here's just a map showing um, an area of, um, I believe that's Squantum, and uh, how we're dividing the community assets up. This work is going to be used, um, this information is going to be used as part of the Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Plan. Um, we'll be holding workshops later in April and going through that. Um, vulnerability assessment uh, is basically an evaluation of how the community assets um, and properties are impacted by um, different natural hazards. Um, so we um, looked at um, existing flood ri risk, starting with 100-year uh, floodplain maps. Um, over 20% of Quincy developed land is in the flood hazard, 13% coastal hazards, and 7% inland. Those inland properties value is over $0.75 billion, and the coastal property is over $1 billion. Um, I mentioned before, geographically, most inland flooding is in the Furnace Brook North area, and um, actually most of the coastal flooding is occurring in the Marymount Blacks Creek area. Uh, future uh, flood risk was determined using uh, sea level rise data looking at one, two, and four feet of sea level rise. The one and two uh, foot is aligns with um, that 60 cent probability of occurrence for the 2030 to 27 um, for Boston Harbor. And you can see here that um, there are a lot of properties that will be impacted as sea level rise occurs. So the most important part of this plan, and if I only had to talk about one thing, I would be talking about the mitigation strategy. That's section seven in the plan, and if you only read one thing, take a look at the mit mitigation strategy. It starts out with um, defining the goals for uh, resiliency vision, and that basically reads as uh, Quincy um, empowers uh, residents, business communities, and city leaders to make near, mid, and long-term changes that will reduce future climate change impact, protect its vital community assets, and adapt to changes already occurring. So that's kind of the basis for picking the projects and the, the process we went through to prioritize them. So all of the mitigation actions um, that we include um, support that resiliency vision and support the hazard mitigation um, goals and objectives, which are included in that chapter seven. Um, 
So I, I won't really go over the details on that. Um, the process is looking at um, mitigation strategies that address the vulnerabilities in the geographic areas, and then going through a process to um, prioritize them. We use a method, a FEMA-approved method called Stapley. Uh, the Stapley method looks at um, social, technical, administrative, political, legal, economic, and environmental impacts for each mitigation project. They're ranked, uh, put into a spreadsheet, and the process you end up with um, high priority, mid priority, and low priority actions. So up here on the slide that no one can read is a list of the high priority mitigation actions um, in order by uh, year of, of implementation. And as Chris mentioned, this is a process we went through um, to give the city a place to start and to use to make recommendations for funding, but it's not anything that's cast in stone and it's not anything that we have to start with the first project and work our way down. Um, and then just we reordered those high priority mitigation actions to get an idea of the numbers that were recommended in each uh, geographic area. So there's 52 projects all together. And um, once the plan is adopted, the cycle begins again. So if there is any uh, comments or concerns about the plan, rest assured that as soon as it's adopted, we can start revising it. And thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, councilors, questions? Comments? Yes. Councilor McCarthy. Thank you, uh, Councilor. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. And uh, looking at both packages here going back and forth, the detail is uh, tremendous, which I knew it was. Tiger Bond has done a tremendous job um, on all our paperwork and all and all the help that they've given us over the past um, 18 months or so. I know that this has gone has gone back a couple of years. I think in the in the making to get to where it is now. And and I believe at this point, just to make sure I'm on the right sheet of music, that um, FEMA has has seen the plan. Um, we're at the point now where uh, I think everything's been covered in that from A to Z, that the council would then go ahead and give its blessing and approve it tonight so we can move on. Because I know, at least in my ward, and I know this is a, a uh, hazard, hazard, hazardous mitigation plan for the city, and I'm in Ward 1. Um, I see a lot of familiar pictures I don't want to see anymore uh, in the package, but um, I know this is for the entire city. So um, I think we're at that point, if I'm, if I'm not... Correct. Off base. Correct. There's there's really not an opportunity to change this plan without going back to square one, right. going to FEMA, which is why I said that if there's something, if there's a comment or there's something in that you want to see addressed, that's wonderful. We'll start making notes. Right. No, I, I don't think, I think you folks have covered everything. I know that everybody in that first row to y'all left uh, has been involved. Uh, has done their due diligence and detailed work in, in all of this, so I want to thank them. I'd like to uh, hopefully um, uh, like to make a motion to, to move on this this evening um, and get it done so we don't waste any time. I know that we have um, some pump houses that are in discussion down in Ward 1 that we've jumped some hurdles locally with MEMA, and now we're waiting for FEMA to get involved so I'd like to see it keep rolling. I think everybody here would too, because as I said, it's just not a ward one thing. It's, it's Furnace Brook, it's West Quincy, it's Squanum, it's the whole work. So um, I'd like to make a motion to approve the plan tonight. Very good, very good, Council Mahoney. I mean, um, uh, McCarthy, sorry about that. Um, Councilor Devona. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, thank you, Councilor McCarthy, on all your hard work uh, working with us this group, this mitigation um, adoption uh, action plan. Um, just, to, just to back up here, just for, just for one year, I guess I could say, is uh, we're coming up on the one year, one month mark with 
um, the disastrous March 2nd, um, March, March 2nd to March 4th storm, which um, came through here and brought on devastation. I've never seen anything like that in our backyard. I'm a Ward 1 resident as well as a, a counselor at large. I live on Chickatawbit Road, which is a street that is at the front of this um, seawall repair um, existence. Um, and I, I just saw us as a city, as, as, as a group, um, go through the endeavors of um, people being without power for almost a whole week, people being stuck on a peninsula, an island, basically, um, the destruction of Post Island Road, which I could not believe that the wind would, the water would get up that high. And um, people are in the process right now with getting their houses um, taken down and built back up. I know Council McCarthy has been working real hard with um, the planning and all the different conservation um, uh, boards and meetings that he has to do. Um, I know I brought forth a resolution back in, in November um, before the snow season, you know, before the high winds were going to come through. Luckily, um, with the guidance under um, Al Gracioso and the DPW commissioner and his, and his, and his team, they did a fantastic job with mitigating a lot of other semi-storms, not to these nature of stuff, but with catch basins and clearing things and, and just pre-storm activity um, to be ready for these just in case. Uh, you never know when the turn's going to take. Um, just, just a little elaboration on, um, I know I brought forward the resolution about the pumping stations um, and, the, and I see on here the stormwater pumping station, one to two years, House Neck in Germantown, and then I also see pump station rehabilitation, which is Murray Mountain Blacks Creek, which is a one, two year um, time frame, which is on the front end of this mitigation plan, which, which I like to see. Have you figured out where this is going to be located or is it, was it our existing one? Are we moving it? Is, and, and can you give me any regulations on when you do the pumping, where does that water have to go? Would anybody be able to answer those questions? Uh, in regard to the Post Island pump station, uh, the city has applied for a pre-disaster mitigation grant for $2.8 million. Uh, that's in the works. We should hear on that in June time frame. As far as the specific location, uh, we have to do hydraulic modeling, and we're in the process of doing that now. Ty and Bond has taken the lead on the modeling right along the coast. Uh, the Corps of Engineers will be involved doing some additional modeling um, in the Strand area, and the, the, there's a pipe that goes underneath that. So we're, we're in the process of, through modeling, uh, figuring out where the water and the best place for the pump station. Now, is this going to be on the Post Island Road side? Or, I mean, I know when the water had seeped through that wall, it, it had gone all the way to C Street, and the water went up to at least, I'd say, five feet onto the dike. So it, was, it, it just crept its way up that area. Where particularly are you looking? Is it on Post Island? Is it more down C Street? Is it by the we're dike? We're looking at Post Island. We're looking at C Street. We're looking at the other side. Okay. Uh, the, the water crested C Street. I know. Um, and impact of the waters on Post Island. And then during the low tide, uh, the capacity of the system couldn't handle it. Uh, a lot of the outfall pipes were below the low tide, even on the third cycle going down. So the pump station on Post Island, for example, would have helped mitigate the draining of the system. Um, so we're looking at three potential pumps, maybe at one pump house. Uh, high capacity, mid capacity, low capacity, because you have to pump it at different, different levels. Once the water gets through, it has to get back out. Now, where are you pumping it to? Are you gonna pump it back into the ocean? Is there, a, is there an area that you can pump it to Isn't to I, let it sit? The, the plan is to pump it back into the ocean. Okay. Uh, we may have to pump it someplace inland first. Uh, the permitting for that hasn't been done yet. Okay, and you can do that. You can pump it. You can pump the water back into the ocean. Is that correct? Well, severe permitting involved. Permitting involved. Okay. Look at that. I, I just want to thank your team for recognizing um, that 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 resolution I brought forward in November. I, I'm ha very happy to see um, and be a participant of, of Council McCarthy's seawall repairs, which gave us a lot of information on this. Um, does this have anything to do with the, the funding that we gave to? in conjunction with Boston 
to do that resiliency. Um, we did a resiliency, we, we appropriated some funding um, to go and pair with Boston. Does this have anything to do with this mitigation? Or is this a separate? That's the 100,000. 100, yeah, the 100,000 dollars, okay, for the study. Okay. Councilor, um, that is separate. That 100,000 was for the, um, to plan for the barrier. Yes. There was study in the barrier. Okay, so that's a, that's a separate entity. Yeah. Okay, well, we're taking care of all the things. I want to thank you, um, um, uh, Commissioner Graciosa, for all your hard work, Paul Costello, um, Woodward and Curran, the whole gang. Uh, thank you for you guys for coming out tonight. I'd like to see this. Um, we're, we're putting things into action here. So very happy to be here, you guys. Thank you. I just I did want to reiterate that um, I'm I'm involved in the application of grants and uh, so we're we're pending on uh, pre-disaster mitigation grant for the the pump station and without this adoption they can't give us a grant so that's clear. I'm happy to support this with my fellow counselor here that, that made the motion. I know we don't have to have a second here, but uh, I'm going to be in full support of this. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councilor DeBona. Councilor Liang. I mean, whether this is to you or to um, the mayor's chief of staff, I just, you know, I think that um, the work that you guys have done over the years and, and particularly, you know, how much you've had to change given the different storms that have come your way during the planning process, I think is really critical. And I'm happy to see that you know, we have a plan in place that's going to really dictate the work ahead of us, whether it's, you know, within the DPW or in the planning department with our development across the city. Um, pertinent to our role up here, I think, you know, getting an understanding of what's to come is really important because, you know, any costs um, that come with the mitigation, I think, is, is obviously upon us to make sure that, you know, we're supporting all of these repairs that we have to make. Um, and so, you know, the mitigation is one aspect of it, but I also want to know, um, is this also going to drive any proactive steps we're going to take as a city to make sure that not only are we prepared in case of a disaster, because um, you can only prepare so much, right? Mother Nature is Mother Nature, and, and to an extent, we can't predict 100% what's going to happen, but um, it sounds like this is going to prepare us to the best of our abilities for any disasters that come our way, but are we also then going to now, um, in this process of these 52 projects, also implement um, some proactive measures too? Um, there is, um, there's opportunities in there for, um, for education, public education, um, where a lot of the, the items like that, they're open-ended. They really not, they're called, they're, they're, they, they're stated as um, the city will engage in, uh, public education to help prepare for the impacts of climate change. So there, there's open-ended projects in here that address topics in a, in a more general way. Um, we're um, engaging in workshops um, with the public, uh, more like a focused public workshop in April. Um, the MVP will be using the um, hazard mitigation plan as a base to work from and then having each of the participants um, have, you know, kind of give their, their feel um, on the projects. So there's going to be opportunity for um, public en engagement and a, a discussion about emphasizing how to use the information that's in the hazard mitigation plan. Okay, so will the hazard mitigation plan then, I, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to understand because I, I I think I'm of the understanding that it, all, it provides um, opportunity for education so folks can be prepared um, in case of a disaster, but I'm also hoping that uh, we can take this opportunity to take this wealth of information to then also drive what we're going to do as a city yeah. to make any necessary improvements or, again, you know, to physically fix our infrastructure to be, be as so, prepared as possible. So will this also help to lay out those plans as well, or is that more on the purview it's of a our... Step, it's a step in that direction. The, the hope is that every city department takes a look at this. Um, we did a capabilities assessment of each department um, in the city of Quincy that um, overlapped with hazard mitigation, that they'll take this information and they'll look at the services that they provide, the plans that they write, and have it be consistent. 
So it's, it is an opportunity to reach out into every aspect of the city That's as great. well as um, public information as well. Okay, so and this is also um, for the next five years, but what flexibility do we have if we, um, you know, as a body and as a community take that next step, we approve this plan and it goes back to FEMA and we move forward on it. I mean, this is the plan, it's the five-year plan, but then what kind of flexibility do we have to make any changes to it? Um, if God forbid, within that next five years, we see um, another disaster. You can make storm. changes to the plan at any time. Okay. So it won't affect what we've no. already approved and sent to FEMA no. today if we end no. up doing that today. Okay. And it won't then jeopardize any funding that we could potentially get no. from them because as well. it's going to be the date that you have the plan, mm -hmm. and then as you as you make revisions to the plan, um, you just will note it. It's not it's not going to go back to FEMA for a re revision. It will be just your working plan, updates in your working plan. Okay, that's good to know because sometimes that process can be really strenuous and sometimes when it comes to these, uh, I think things, you know, if we have a plan and we're ready to implement it and we're ready to make these kinds of changes we need to uh, be preventative in the city, I wouldn't want bureaucracy so to hold it's, up any it's, of that. It's so. part, that's part of the review process. The mm -hmm. city is going to um, have, they have a core team and they're gonna meet every year and they're gonna discuss the plans that were recommended progress that's been made, changes in hazard mitigation that might warrant going a slightly different track. Mm -hmm. It's a very, very flexible plan. That's, uh, that's the, um, discussed in the plan evaluation and maintenance plan. plan. So um, the, you're, there's a requirement to, uh, to report back in on the progress of the plan. That's great. I'm really excited. I'm, I, I'm glad that we are sort of meeting these challenges head on as a city and that we're working with you guys to do so. Um, I'm not going to pretend to be the expert when it comes to um, these particular issues, but I do know that it is something that we have to be front of mind with. And I'm glad to see that our different departments are working uh, with you guys to make sure that we are addressing this head on. So thank you for your time. Thank you for your work on this um, and for you know presenting to us tonight this information. But thank you. Welcome, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I hope you read it. Yeah. No, it's good. It's helpful information to have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Yang. Thank you. We're going to take a. We're going to recess and go into the regular council session, and then don't go anywhere because there's still a few more questions. So, thank you.
Good evening, everyone. I would like to call to order the April 1st, 2019 meeting of the Quincy City Council. Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll? Councilor Kane. Councilor DeBona. Present. Councilor Harris. Present. Councilor Hughes. Councilor Liang. Present. Councilor Mahoney. Present. Councilor McCarthy. Present. Councilor Palmucci. President Kroll. Present. Six members. Six you members. Have we have a quorum. At this point in time, folks, if you please rise and join me in a moment of silence, please use it as you wish. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you kindly. Madam Clerk, the uh, first item on the agenda, please. First, I'm going to read into the record the uh, open, open meeting, meeting. law. Pursuant to the open meeting law, any person may make an audio or video recording of this public meeting or may transmit the meeting through any medium. Attendees are therefore advised that such recordings or transmissions are being made, whether perceived or unperceived, by those present and are deemed acknowledged and permissible. And number one on the agenda is 2019-063, order nomination and election of city clerk. Councilor McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I have the honor tonight to nominate um, a young lady who's done a tremendous job. Uh, she's filled big shoes uh, here at the uh, City Council and for the city, and uh, has done a tremendous job uh, overall. And so uh, it's my pleasure this evening to nominate Nicole L. Crispo for uh, City Clerk for another term. Motion placed into nomination for Nicole Crispo on the motion. Councilor Hughes. Thank you. Councilor. Thank you, President Carl. Um, it's a pleasure to get here just in the nick of time <laughs> to second the nomination of Nicole Crispo. Um, I just, I know everyone up here feels the same as well as the several councilors before all of us who've been tremendously helped by Nicole, not only by her knowledge at her job, her love of the city, but her true love of helping people and the friendship that she has offered all of us. So uh, I'm so pleased that she has decided to stay <laughs> another term and uh, happily second the nomination of Nicole Crespo. Thank you, Councillor. And motion made by Councillor McCarthy, second by Councillor Hughes. Councillor Bone, did you have something? Or you? Yeah, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I just want to just say a few words about Nicole Crispo, um, and I'm happy to support it as well. Uh, just, you know, um, coming onto the council four years ago and, and having Joe Shea, some big fill, shoes to fill, and he was on here for four months, and then uh, Nicole Crispo came in and did a fantastic job over the last few years. I just want to say you've been very reliable, um, very accessible to talk to um, on all different issues, whether it be at the polling stations and and all those different things about, um, you know, just safety and public safety of the children. You've just been, you, you've been a great, great clerk. And I, I want to thank you for all your work. And I'm looking forward to the next few years. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilor. Uh, motion made by Council McCarthy, second by Council Hughes to place into nomination Nicole Crispo for city clerk. And I would ask Council Yang. Finish your thought if you had. I didn't want to cut you off. Oh, no, please. I was just going to our uh, role. So, yeah, please. No, I just wanted to take the opportunity to, uh, to thank Nikki. She has been um, phenomenal, not only here, you know, on the city council, but I, um, I've gotten to know her over, over my course of um, just being a resident here in the city or a business owner here in the city and now as a counselor here in the city. And she has been amazing. And I can't say enough nice things about her, but I want to take the opportunity to thank her for just all around um, being a phenomenal person, being a phenomenal employee of the city. Um, and I'm really excited to be able to uh, support her again tonight. So thank you for the opportunity to Absolutely, say so. Absolutely, Council. Thank you. Um, motion made by Council McCarthy, second by Council Hughes. The response uh, at point of roll will be Nicole Crispo. Nicole Crispo, will you please lead us in the uh, roll? Council DeBona. Nicole Crispo. Council Harris. Nicole 
Nicole Crispo. Councilor Hughes. Nicole Crispo. Councilor Liang. Nicole Crispo. Councilor Mahoney. Nicole Crispo. Councilor McCarthy. Nicole Crispo. President Kroll. Nicole Crispo. Seven members. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Would you care for the microphone, Madam Clark? I just want to say um, thank you to all of you for being so good to me and over the last three years. And um, I am humbled and honored to serve as your city clerk for you and all the residents of the city. Thank you. And we are happy to have you. So thank you. Um, next item on the agenda, please. Next item is number two, 2019-064, a gift for $625 from various donors for DEAR. Motion made by Councilor DeBone in the way of the reading on the motion, Councilor. Um, just like to approve, make a motion to approve this and send a letter of thank you. Thank you, motion made by Councilor DeBone, a second by Councilor McCarthy. Any discussion? Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Councilor DeBona. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Hughes. Yes. Council Liang, yes. Council Mahoney, yes. Council McCarthy, yes. President Krull. Yes. Seven Six, members. Seven members. The gift is accepted. Next item on the agenda, please, Madam Clerk. Next is number three, 2019-065, a resolve for Financial Literacy Month 2019 student loan debt. Thank you very much, Madam Clerk. This is something that uh, I brought forward as a city council president. Uh, similar to what we did about a year ago when we took up uh, two different subject areas uh, during April, which obviously is uh, nationally known as Financial Literacy Month. Uh, last year, we talked through Social Security, as well as examined some of the tools that the city of Quincy currently has in their toolboxes, in their toolbox to help uh, residents through you know various tax situations, abatement situations, etc. This year, um, obviously, a very uh, wide subject matter that we're going to facilitate a discussion on, and it's uh, student loan debt. Um, obviously, it is an issue that. Uh, affects many individuals throughout the country uh, to the tune of 1.3 plus trillion dollars. Um, you know, the goal of the exercise is similar to what we did last year. We will provide the forum through Council Mahoney's leadership and the Education Committee. Thank you for your willingness to do that. And uh, we will have a speaker come in to kind of, again, just distribute information on subjects that sometimes are somewhat complicated for people and hope through hopefully through the medium such as Quincy Access Television and our friends in the, uh, in the local media, uh, just provide a level of comfortability for people to digest these complex subjects within the comfort of their own home. Um, so with that, I would just make a motion to refer to the Education Committee for a meeting to be scheduled later this evening. All those in favor? Opposed? All right, the item heads over to education. All right, so at this point, we are going to approve the previous meeting minutes from March 18, 2019. All those in favor? Opposed, the ayes have it. I'm going to take our recess from the regularly scheduled city council meeting, go back to the environmental committee, and we'll be back in session with the regularly scheduled city council meeting. So brief recess. Going back, you know. We're going to reopen now um, the Environmental and Public Health Committee meeting and um, Councilor to speak, Councilor Mahoney. Oh, sorry. So could we just go back, to, for, and you did this in 2013 as well, correct? No, I did not. Did the city do a plan in 2013? The, the plan, uh, the, last, um, the last time the plan was updated was 2013. 
the last time the plan. So, mm -hmm. so um, is it uh, is it substantially changed since 2013 as far as the depth it, of the information? It has very much substantially changed. Okay. And in the 2013 plan, did 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 we see much accomplished from the 2013 plan for the list of um, of potential <clears throat> issues that we had? There is um, in the beginning of the mitigation section mm -hmm. in chapter seven. Yep which is the most important chapter to read. Um, there's a discussion in the first table, 7.1, yep. is a review of the 2013 mitigation actions that were in the 2013 plan. There was, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, I, I don't know exactly know what the number is, uh, four, four and a half pages worth of projects. Um, some of them are still in progress. Uh, many of them were completed. Mm -hmm. A few of them were deleted yeah. as not being in Important anymore, okay. and a few of them were revised based the, on circumstances changing. The reason why I ask is I know that that the, the presentation you provided to us is very very big, and sometimes it's helpful to see what we were able to accomplish from the last one to this one. Although it's in your pres it's in it's in the big binder that you provided to us, but for the general public to be able to see the accomplishments of the city as well as what we've got accomplished and what we're future working towards, it's not really a, it's just meant to be just helpful because some people right. would like to see that. So right. well, they're they're very um, they're very specific mm -hmm. projects here, and um, some of the projects we have. Um, a, a category which is um, basically the administrative capabilities of each department. Mm -hmm. And some of these projects which were listed as mitigation strategies were really more talking about capabilities within departments mm -hmm. rather than projects. Right. So we reorganized the 2013 um, one for, project, for things that were ongoing yeah. um, to put into capabilities such as um, participation in the National Flood Insurance Program. Well, the reason why I bring that up, though, again, is that this is our second go around for this. So 2013, this is our second five-year plan. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and I, I, the package is like this big that you gave to us. So it's it's a lot. It's, yes. yes. There's there's the eight-page summary. No, no, I realize that. <laughs> but I'm saying in the presentation we talked about tonight, we were specifically just talking about the next five years. I just was trying to do a quick recap. I was hoping right. for the general audience. But this this is really just a comprehensive plan going forward for the next five years. Um, for FEMA that we're, we're getting approved by FEMA that will potentially open up opportunities for the city of Quincy f for grant money. Um, correct. correct. The, um, the, in order to be successfully competitive for mm -hmm. FEMA grants, mm -hmm. um, it really wants to be in your hazard mitigation plan. You're not going to get points right. if, it's, if it's a project that hasn't already been discussed and evaluated. Right. But I also want people to know at home, too, that this is, is kind of a catch-22. If we want to be able to get FEMA or grant money for any of the projects we're doing here in Quincy, mm -hmm. we have to apply. We have to, we have to do this five-year plan to kind of check off the boxes to be able to, to do that. But this has nothing. We're not saying we agree with FEMA's flood maps. We're not agreeing with anything other than the fact that we want to present this and be able to op open opportunities for the city of Quincy to be able to potentially get grant money or get funding outside of taxpayer dollars, correct? Right. Generally right. speaking. Yes. So, yes. yes. And yeah, yeah the, the maps that are used in here are the most recent maps that the city went through an you know, extensive period of time mm -hmm. revising different areas. So everything used in here is all the most up-to-date information. And when were these maps updated? Uh, the last revisions were in 2017. The latest map revisions were 2017, so very, very up-to-date information. Those are our map revisions or FEMA's rep map revisions? Those are revision. The city contested the FEMA um, for yeah. maps when they came yeah. out. For maps from FEMA. Right, and so they're the, the revised maps, okay. which when is were the next adopted time, by FEMA. When is the them. next um, time that FEMA will be reviewing maps? I don't know the answer to that question, but Joe does. Good evening, I'm Joseph Shea, a senior principal with Wooded and Curran, an engineering firm that's been assisting the city with their FEMA flood maps, uh, the topic of this current question. Um, FEMA has initiated a process called the risk map process. That is their map update process that they've done historically every six or seven or eight years. Uh, they've started the process. I'm, I'm unaware of a target completion date, but I would expect sometime in 20 or 21 uh, would be the next time that there is a official 
flood insurance rate map issuance to Quincy. Uh, since the last time the maps were updated, uh, just to be clear, uh, which was June 4th, 2014, uh, there's been seven modifications or improvements because of the city driving for corrections to its maps. Uh, so just to be clear, when we say 2017 was the last update, that was the last correction. Last correction. And we're not anticipating any other corrections. Uh, we're perpetually correcting the maps. It's actually ongoing annually. Uh, so we but when they will be, we'll, we'll update them. the maps. Okay. I just wanted to, to just have that clarification, too, because this is a five-year plan. I mean, we talk about FEMA in here, and the next step is us approving this plan. It will go back to FEMA. But there's no finding, and there's a list of, um, you know, basically you did a, a, an inventory of what potentially is the one- to two-year plan, three- to five-year plan for potential things that could happen in the city. But this isn't a financial package. Nobody's approving anything. But there's potential money that we could qualify for for certain assets that we might need to fix. And those priorities could change potentially depending on what's happening in the city and what potential weather hazards could be happening as well. Is that correct? That is correct, yeah. Okay. Within this framework. Yeah, and there was one question that I did have in your presentation because it was, um, it was when we were talking about, I mean, I know that you mentioned that um, climate change is, a, is something that they added potentially. Um, Climate change was not part of the 2013 plan. Mm -hmm. um, climate change was not part of the, uh, I forgot the date of the last uh, Massachusetts uh, climate plan. I mean, the hazard mitigation plan. I forget the date of it. Uh, the state um, added climate change to its 2018 plan. Mm -hmm. And the, the, every community that participates in the hazard mitigation plan has to consider every single natural hazard that's included in the state hazard mitigation plan. And if they don't choose to include it, mm -hmm. they have to state why. Okay. Um, there was no reason to not include it because Quincy has gone through extensive uh, studies uh, discussing the impacts of climate change on coastal flooding. Which I think every, I think every community should do. Correct. That. But as you said, the top natural hazard risks for Quincy climate change isn't really one of them. It's really the, the culverts failing, the snows and blizzard storms, and those types of things that you highlighted as your top, the top tiers. Um, the top, the greatest flood, the greatest natural hazard risk was severe winter weather, coastal erosion, coastal and inland flooding, and nor'easters. Which is, I mean, that's, and then you go to the next, where you go to your next section where you kind of talk about some of the storms. The one other thing that you mentioned, it was when you were talking about the areas of flooding and concerns. So this is just for clarification for me because of sure. what I heard. Um, you know, you were talking about, you know, the, the backups that they're having in certain areas and then keeping up with development. What do you mean by keeping up with development? Um, well, I guess let me rephrase that to say, do you want to rephrase that? Don't no, worry. Oh, okay. Um, there, the infrastructure in the town, the city is constantly needing to make improvements mm -hmm. to it. Yeah. And as um, development occurs, uh, more impervious surfaces are created, more runoff is generated. So mm -hmm. that was the connection between development, developed areas, impervious surfaces, and increased storm drainage. Which makes complete sense. I mean, we're a city that's it's it's growing. Right. Um, things are changing from single-family homes to ten units. That changes the Correct. capacity for storage and drainage and everything else. And the other thing that's happening is rainfall is increasing. Mm -hmm. We're getting rainfall um, at um, higher, higher concentrations yeah. in a shorter period. Yeah. So some of the design calculations that you know may, and I shouldn't speak to them because I don't know everything about that is stormwater, yeah. um, but oftentimes in other communities, yeah. um, the capacity is undersized. Yeah, I mean, when, they, when you make a development, you're not, you're not anticipating it's gonna be a, you know, five inches of rain in an hour. You're anticipating right. it's gonna be five inches of rain in a season. So, right, um, and this is, you know, this is a, a, a similar issue, you know, all across Massachusetts. Right. That, um, that storm drainage is, is undersized as the communities grow and they're constantly having to go in and make uh, upgrades. So I guess the, uh, the last question that I, I, mean, I won't promise it's the last because sometimes it fears another one. Um, <laughs> when looking at this, and this is a comprehensive plan for, um, for, you know, for FEMA, and we're 
talking about that interconnectivity of departments. Mm -hmm. um, and we have obviously a lot of development that's going on in the city of Quincy. And we have these maps and we have the sewer drainage that we talked about um, just recently in another meeting. Um, are we tying that development part into this plan as well as what we need to have accomplished in the, in, in the I'm hoping I'm, this is going to play into somebody up here to answer. Because when we have this um, high priority mitigation plan, mm -hmm. um, imagining that there's certain sections of the city that if there's development that's happening that we'll be able to look at and recognize that that might be a high impact area if this development was to go on that could potentially create an issue. Is that something that we're doing when we're looking at those things? Oh, John. Yeah. Um, See, I played right into you. I knew I was. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Rob Stevens, Deputy Planning Director I'm giving here. Giving you all an opportunity today. Yeah, <laughs> thank you with the City of Quincy. Um, so the, the development question is a fascinating one because uh, a lot of uh, what we find uh, in, through our work in the planning department is a lot of old pipes. Mm -hmm. And in fact, um, I was part of the project that uh, relocated the Old Town Brook. Mm -hmm. And we were pulling out uh, granite culvert uh, work. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that was four or five years uh, ago. Yeah. Uh, what you see now on the Hancock lot is a whole new state-of-the-art stormwater system in that lot where it used to be sheet flow right into the town brook. Mm -hmm. um, I also think of the Central Middle School redevelopment um, uh, that occurred uh, not too long ago that was sheet flow again on that site mm -hmm. now uh, there's a lot of water quality units installed as part of that development and we're trying to improve the whole butler's pond area mm -hmm. now with the planning board i do a lot of the planning board uh, review uh, with uh, my colleagues and uh, we do do uh, independent peer review engineering and i'd have to say reviewing the stormwater of all the new development is probably our highest priority mm -hmm. and you know having the plan and it's one of the reasons why we quarterback the the update this time is because I think planning uh, has that ability to see across mm -hmm. uh, the different departments and try to you know get this information uh, down into those boards and committee members uh, into those uh, uh, my colleagues and the other departments you know especially with uh, public works here uh, obviously we have the commissioner and Paul Costello here we work with uh, Chen Sang and a bunch of other folks uh, Peter Hoyt uh, Mark Valpondo uh, we're in communication with those folks uh, regularly on a lot of the development so I appreciate that. I just wanted to make sure that we were talking about that interconnectivity because this is a five-year plan. It's for, um, it's obviously, it's, it's something that the city needs to be able to accomplish and get done. It's not a financial commitment to the city. It's basically a plan and something that we can use as, um, that we can reference and go to and recognize when we're doing those plans. Um, I think we just had you up here the last time and I was asking what was our comprehensive plan of all our, of our sores and piping in the city of Quincy and what I was told is we have 100% of the um, mapping of all of those things but only 20% of the city is, is that correct? 20% of the city, I think that was what I was told that we, um, that we have completed for that, for as the, meaning that the, the structures being sound or not, just like what you were talking about, whether or not we're going to replace something um, that was probably original to the city, I want to say, when you talk about the culverts that we're just talking about from Central to the Town Brook. But the reality of it is, is that's another big piece that we have to get accomplished as well, separate from this. Absolutely. But this piece alone is going to help us um, create a, you know, a, 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 it's creating a priority mitigation plan, but it's just that it's a plan and it could change depending on um, what happens that we might need to put something up higher on the list that might be a two to two years out because it might become something that's really important but most importantly it's a five-year plan that we're providing to fema that will open up hopefully opportunities for the city to <clears throat> potentially get out other resources for money um for this yeah. so i know a lot of work went into this i did i did just want to take my mom because i know that in 2013 you did it and this is the second time we're going to, well, I know you didn't, but the city did it. The city did it. And this is our second go around. And we learn a lot from that. So hopefully we did have a lot of learnings from that. And I know, too, when we talk about storms and different things that are going on in the city, I know even from the time period that we've had some of these storms, the historical data, when we, we go back and look at that, it's it, it, in a short period of time. And I think, Al, you are brand new at your job. Um, when we had the nor'easter in January and then the following one in, in March. In that short period of time, and, it, and this is no fault of the city, it's just Mother Nature in this way, but the weather came in and hit us in that January and it kind of caught us off guard. 
And I know that we had a meeting. I know it was Mr. McCarthy and myself because we were new on the council and we were getting a lot of information. And I think, Mr. Costello, you were talking about how you were able to go back and look at the maps and recognize some things from the storm. And I believe there were some findings from that because we were better prepared in March when we, the next storm came in to get people not necessarily protect the homes for the damage that was done, but potentially get people out of a high-risk area to, to safety faster. Because when those roads get shut down, it can be terribly scary for somebody that might be of high risk. So it's something that we can't prevent when we're talking about something like this when it comes to, net, to Mother Nature. But it is something that I think we are trying to work better at and more collaboratively with. So um, it doesn't happen all the time. but. <laughs> wanted to mention uh, um, in a planning planning for these uh, MVP workshops in April um, we were sitting with um, uh, Lieutenant Gillen and Ali Simon Simon um, and they are they saw the maps we had them laid out on the table and they're going we're laminating and they're going up on the wall so mm -hmm. they're not all, they're extremely happy to have this information to use mm -hmm. uh, for um, for their planning purposes. And we hope they'll also be able to use that web tool too, which has all of the mapping and all of the vulnerable community assets, all GIS based, and anyone can access it. And uh, I'll give you that URL if you would like. Absolutely. Well, I thank you very much. And like I said, the most important thing that I got out of this is I just really hope that we're looking at what's going in development because we are developing, to me, at a rapid speed. Um, we should probably slow down a little bit at that so we can catch up to all the work that needs to be done because it's not helping the city if we're always trying to play catch up. But I understand a lot of the work that's gone into it. So thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions? And, uh, thank you, um, Council Mahoney. Um, President Crow would uh, like to ask a question. Th thank you, Council. Uh, good evening, Gabrielle. Um, I spent some time with reading this over the weekend, and just my own unsolicited opinion, I think this is the gold standard of reporting. I, I really do believe that. This is a tremendous body of work, and you can tell that it is... Uh, you know, a lot of time and effort um, put into it. So, you know, that's, that's always helpful. Um, just my own experience kind of growing up in the city, I grew up in a flood zone, um, the corner of Cross Street and Miller Street. Mm -hmm. So I'm intimately familiar with, and that's before the pumping station on Furnace Avenue, intimately familiar with what happens when, um, you know, your, your area, your home is not in a position to be protected. And, um, you know, I was, I was pretty young at the time, and I remember that uh, the basement would fill up. And I remember, you know, the, the fear and the, and the frantic uh, and, and the chaos in the household, um, you know. And to, to a large extent right now, being in this seat, I, I kind of wish that, um, you know, these were conversations that were being tackled back then. Um, I didn't really know sort of the gravity of it because I was pretty young, but you could just tell, you know, um, in the way that my parents uh, emotionally dealt with it, that uh, you know, these you can't anticipate when it's going to happen, but you can certainly plan for it. That's my long way of saying that one statement. Um, so I'm glad that you know we're looking at this. You know, 52 projects, five years. Somebody must have a a rough number about what we could be talking about dollars, right? I would think we do. Awesome. I mean, we, we did, we went back and forth between like actually trying to put actual numbers and then just went to, you know, $1 sign to, you know, like yeah. really, uh, really no, a pretty broad, broad sure. range. It's like a um, I, I just honestly, I can't remember what that total was, but it was a lot of money. It was a lot of money. I just, I have it on a spreadsheet somewhere. Um, so again, there's, there's no commitment per se, right? And the way that my mind works, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, is, you know, I just, in, we talked, what was the word, interconnected? Interconnectivity, I think, is what my counselor, my fellow counselor said. I just look at sort of this plan and how it interconnects with all the other, you know, financial measures that we, we contemplate. But... Um, I know things were broke out, you know, this is year one, this is year between years one and three, between years, you know, two and four and, you know, three and five and so on and so forth. Um, there's no financial 
commitment with this particular plan today. That's correct, right? Correct. And um, the, t the table in uh, Chapter 7, Mitigation yep, Strategy. I read that pretty closely. You did. And, yep. and it lays out, um, you know, all the potential of yep. funding opportunities. Yep. And, you know, that's... Um, that is something that the town is having more and more success with yep. is is getting grants and uh, EOEA, DEM, seawall repair funds, uh, FEMA, um, coastal zone resiliency grants. Um, I could name more grants that the city has been successful with. No question. They mm -hmm. all it, you there's a, the box to put down on there. Has the town done a hazard mitigation plan? Has the town participated in municipal vulnerability preparedness? So you check those boxes and you get bumped up for priority for funding. So um, the town, the city is. Um, been successful with grants, and I'm sure they're going to continue to pursue those at um, an even a greater rate going into the future to help offset some of these tremendous costs. And just obviously listening to your testimony, uh, you know, your your talk and your presentation, uh, it's, it's 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 clear and evident to me that you've been you've been doing this for a while. So, um, and I'm assuming you do this for other cities and towns as well. We do. But, right. Yeah. Uh, what's a typical I mean, I'm not going to hold you to it. I'm just trying to connect it in my brain. Like, what's a typical reimbursement rate? Like, when you have a plan like this, um, is it for, for in doing a plan? Just yeah, just um, well, this this was so you have a document. Uh, it opens paid, you up to opportunity. Right? Um, this was paid for with um, uh, with uh, I believe it was um, twenty four thousand dollars from the FEMA grants and uh, about a fifty percent match from the city of Quincy. Um, because they knew that they that twenty four thousand dollars wasn't going to get them all of the information and analysis they needed to have the um, the strength in a plan that they wanted. No, I, again, I think this is a right. That's my opening statement. I think this is a fabulous plan. So um, you know, communities do hazard mitigation plans for twenty thousand dollars. They do it for one hundred and twenty thousand right. dollars. I guess the question becomes: So, you know, we we have a we have a strong body of work here. We have a clear case as to you know the current state of the nation. Yeah. How, in your experience, I guess having something like this, does it uh, will it unlock? Oh yes, like absolutely. A tremendous amount of opportunity. I mean, opportunity. absolutely. I, I, I've, I FEMA think love of, to see this. I think um, you can say Quincy is a poster child for coastal storms in the eyes of FEMA. And I think the money will roll in. Gotcha. So, you want, go ahead. Hey, people. Uh, Joseph Shea again. To add a little color to your question, Mr. President. Yeah, please. Um, <clears throat> the, the report that was done three years ago unlocked FEMA funding for the Miller Cross Furnace Ave neighborhood you grew up in. Uh, what is it? I'm sorry. The, the, the report that was done three yep. years ago mm -hmm. unlocked funding for the Miller Cross Furnace Ave oh, neighborhood Cross. pump station. Uh, to your specific financial question, that made available to the city $5.3 million of free money for that from one FEMA project. for that pump station. Yep. That was 75% of the cost. So the city will get about six and a half million dollars worth of pumping infrastructure in the neighborhood you grew up in, which we know loves badly. Yeah, sure. Of which FEMA, because of the approval of these type of documents, funds seventy-five percent. So it's a, it's a certainly is that's one of the best deals available, driven by these great reports. In reimbursement rates obviously alter project by project, you know, merit by merit. I mean, I don't, I don't know the intricacies of the back, you know. They do. Channel. Yeah. They do. The federal level, 75%. Um, these reports can make you more eligible and a better applicant for state revolving fund loans um, as well, yeah, which at some point sometimes have grant components, sometimes are low interest loans, but it basically unlocks many of the avenues you have available to you. And this will sort of avail itself again. I looked at Section 7, that shows the targeted breakout over five years. I'm assuming, um, Joe, you work sort of in conjunction with Ty and Bond yes, through closely. this process, through this program. The City Council, you know, just say hypothetically year one, 
the things that are on for year one will be presented to us in some capacity with hopefully reimbursements from other entities? Uh, always. That, so for, for year one, it's a lot of the very uh, fast moving projects when you look at the table. Um, however, we always look to try to find some sort of mitigation with federal or state funding for that presentation package. That's one of the challenges with giving a number is the goal of following this process is to seek funds from the state, from the feds, or any other opportunity uh, so that when we come in with the individual funding package for a specific project X, Y, or Z, you see the breakdown of other people's funds and then the city's contribution. So the goal is to take this plan, get it approved, go meet with whomever to hopefully unlock some money types and then come to the city council at some point with a more targeted plan on what we're doing. Correct, that's yeah. a, the goal and the process, yes. Yep. So year one, and I was just kind of curious because I'm not even sure, the uh, uh, Faxon Park, was it Overlook or Outreach? Oh, no. Come back to um, Gabrielle for that. <laughs> the Faxon Park, that was, uh, that was a fire hazard. Um, where neighbors were piling brush in an area and um, well, was that it, the it, overlook it, I believe so I believe so and uh, I I don't know all each of these projects in, in great detail but they there was a decision made to keep the project so so we don't necessarily know is it the um, overlook at Faxon Park, just like a, a cul-de-sac. Uh, look out and over. It's it's uh, my district. Faxon yeah, Park. It was now. um. Was it widen and maintain the fire road? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Widen and maintain the fire road. Is that the? Okay, so is, are, are you looking at the slides? I'm just trying to, I, no, I have okay. more I detail on the project. Section seven, it showed, uh, um, actually it showed in the slide too. I think it was uh, Faxon Park. Faxon outreach. Park at Reach. You can jump back to the slide deck if you uh, like. Uh, uh, I key there, so it would be. Fire, brush fire. Um, it's uh, the high priority oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. mitigation. It is. It was conduct outreach to residents about not dumping yard waste in or against the park wall for Faxon Park. And it's, um, it's, it's a partnership with DCR to complete this. Um, it's, it's work that's in progress. And it was important to the fire department to maintain this project. So it stayed in the plan. It went through the Stapley evaluation criteria and it came out as a high priority project, probably because it was easy to implement and had no cost and benefited many people. Yeah, I could tell you that the uh, Pens Hill Neighborhood Association, which is just a local neighborhood group, mm -hmm. every year the city of Quincy does this thing called Cleaner Greener. Yeah. It's coming up on May 2nd. Yep. And the reason I ask is because I was fifth, May 5th, correction. Um, the Facts and Park overreach, I wasn't sure if it was the Facts and Park overlook but either way, like literally, we've been back there on Cleaner Greener and pulled like construction debris. Somebody decided that they were gonna cut out their cell of stairs and in their infinite wisdom, dump them uh, in the middle of Faxon Park. So like oh we've dealt gosh. with stuff like that, which is beyond, uh, you know, that's, that's the benchmark for, uh, for, I don't know, I'm just, I'll reserve my comment. Well, I'm not sure in the exact not, location, but not good maybe that's it. So essentially what you're saying is you want to educate the neighborhood on why they shouldn't. That is, that is the plan. Okay. Um, Mr. Shea, I just have one question for you. It's been a while since we touched base on this, but since we're going through this, I figured I would ask, because I think when we last talked, it came down to like funding, which everything does, right? But the paint pencil drainage study. Yes. Do you remember that? I do remember. It's like an Army Corps. Yeah, I think you resent me documents. This was something I heard about when I first ran for office a while, while back. And yes. uh, there was a, a report produced by the Army Corps of Engineers, if I'm not mistaken. Correct. And it showed that uh, actually down, and I think that's Councilor Hughes's 
district now, Hammond Court ish area, the bottom of Penn's Hill, that uh, maybe the culvert underneath was causing or aiding to uh, substantial drainage issues. Is that part of this? Um, that report uh, that you mentioned um, was a report that was commissioned about 14 years ago mm -hmm. um, by the Army Corps of Engineers. It turned out to be about a three inch thick document and it effectively said, uh, for the low, low price of about $25 million, we can fix Penn's Hill. Um, so it was, a, it was a very large, large capital project as you would expect from the Army wow. Corps. Um, however, within that document, when you peel it, when you peel it apart, there were a number of smaller projects um, that have been worked into capital improvement plans or are on future horizons, some, some work on Kendricks Ave uh, near some swale work, for example, that you can get a very high bang for your buck or, or return on your investment. Um, so we did go through those when in preparation for a number of the recommendations within, in here. within this framework. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I remember, you know, not for uh, complete detail, but it being a, a very, very hefty price tag. And um, I remember you and your uh, professional uh, approach told me it will be very difficult to secure that, you know, uh, allotment of funding that individual in totality. funding for the one uh, and I understand you just kind of you know you sort of cherry pick these items as as funding becomes available but I guess said another way there was some deference paid to that report uh, that obviously impacts the quality of life of people in Penn's Hill when we kind of put our heads together and looked at this document correct yes and it was it was included uh, for example for Penn's Hill DPW staff has a has routine maintenance activities on some swales and some other pipes within the Penns Hill neighborhood uh, that a capital improvement project can, can help with both a belt and suspenders. They'll continue to monitor and make sure that, that the operation of the pipes is sufficient, but, but the increased capacity of the pipes coming off the hill uh, is a capital project it was considered in here. Um, we, because everything in Penns Hill list drips into Bigelow, the Bigelow Pool, uh, when you go through the table, it's blended up in the Bigelow Pool line item. But if I remember correctly, when we approved the DIF funding maybe last time, that uh, infrastructure sewer line maybe that crossed the whole Hancock parking lot was supposed to, in some form or fashion, actually relieve some of the pressure that takes place at the brook down in the Bigelow Elm Street area. Was You're that right. Not That's an, an excellent memory. There's a, there's a separate project with the same name. Sometimes it's called the Spear Street Relief Conduit or the Bigelow Street Relief Conduit. And that's to ensure that water can go directly to the Elm Street, uh, Bracket Street area, as opposed to flowing all the way through the Bigelow neighborhood. Um, that's a project that we discuss quite often. It's a project that is, continues to be part of the downtown's plan uh, for redevelopment when we get to the, the R2 component of the Hancock lot. So it's, it's still got the same name, however, it's a slightly different project underway. So I, I guess, again, as I read this, every ward counselor says, you know, you, you want to be supportive of the mission as a whole, but like what directly impacts the people that you deal with on a, on a daily basis. So the Penn's Hill drainage study from, you know, a while back sort of triggered my, yep. my mind and uh, prompted the question. But it, again, it sounds like, well, I know you've read it because we've talked about it. Uh, quite a few times. Um, sounds like there was some of that thought in that report taken and applied here in some context. Yes. Correct. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, President Crowe. Councilor Mahoney. I just have one quick, I just, out of curiosity, this is a curiosity thing. We were ranked as the fifth highest um, in 19, from 1979 to 2017 for the um, repetitive loss. Who are the other communities for the top, that were in the top four? That's a good question. We got such. I'm going to have to look it up. <laughs> <clears throat> I was just curious. If you could let me know, that would be great. Boston. Oh, you found it. There you go. Boston has to be there. 
they're not named, but you know those communities better. Okay. So, um, from uh, so the ranking is the worst in the red. Okay. So there you go. You can tell us because I I don't know all those communities. I think Plum Island is one of them. <laughs> it's on the North Shore. Um, it looks like Situate Marshfield. I don't know. It, it's it's definitely the South Shore. So Situate Marshfield in that area. Yep. So. I'm missing one, so it will come to me later. But thank you. Thank you, Councilman Mahoney. <laughs> thank you, Councilman Mahoney. So we have uh, on the floor uh, all in favor. The motion. The motion was made. All in favor. All opposed. I just want to thank the group. Nice presentation. A lot of information. Good, good stuff. Um, and with that, I close and I close the. Uh, and I want to thank the the, uh, the council um, for tonight's committee meeting. It was very productive. Thank you. like to call back the regularly scheduled city council meeting um, communications and reports from the mayor other city officers and city boards uh, madam clerk i believe you have a couple of traffics Please. i do have some new traffics to refer to ordinance committee for advertising ward four at do not enter on robert street northbound intersecting with brook ave from 7 a.m. to 8.30 a.m. and from 12 noon to 3 p.m. on school days. Add no right turn on Gilbert Street westbound intersecting with Robert Street from 7.30 a.m. to 8.30 a.m. 12 p.m. to 3 p.m. on school days. Add no right turn on Nightingale Ave westbound intersecting with Robert Street from 7.30 a.m. to 8.30 a.m. from 12 p.m. to 3 p.m. on school days. Add no left turn on Nightingale Ave eastbound intersecting with Robert Street from 7.30 a.m. to 8.30 a.m., 12 p.m. to 3 p.m. school days. And add no right turn on Robert Street southbound intersecting with Nightingale Ave from 7.30 a.m. to 8.30 a.m., 12 p.m. to 3 p.m. on school days. Thank you, Madam Clerk. So those will all be referred to ordinance. Any unfinished business in preceding meeting? Seeing none. Uh, reports of committees, Council Yang, ordinance. Yes, couple of Speak here. Okay, so I just have a few Give me one moment. Let me just queue you up. Oop. There you are. Can you hear me now? It's like a good Verizon commercial in here. All right, so the first is 2019-059, add handicap parking at 75 Independence Avenue. I move positive recommendation. Motion made by Council Yang, second by Councilor Mahoney. Any discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Councilor DeBona. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Council Hughes. Yes. Council Yang. Yes. Council Mahoney. Yes. Council McCarthy. Yes. President Kroll? Yes. Seven members. Seven members. Council Harris recorded as a yes. Thank you. Um, okay, the next is 2019-060. Add do not enter on Hodges Ave intersecting with East Guantam Street from 7 a.m. to 8 a.m., 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. school days. I move positive recommendation. Motion made by Council Yang, second by Councilor Mahoney. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk. Council DeBona? Yes. Council Harris? Yes. Council Hughes? Council Liang. Yes. Council Mahoney. Yes. Council McCarthy. Yes. President Krull. Yes. Okay, and we've got 2019-061. Add no left turn on East Quantum Street westbound intersecting with Hodges Ave from 7 a.m. to 8 a.m., 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. school days. I move positive recommendation. Motion made by Council Yang, second by Councilor Mahoney. Any discussion? Madam Clerk. Council DeBona. Yes. 
Council Harris? Yes. Council Hughes? Yes. Council Liang? Yes. Council Mahoney? Yes. Council McCarthy? Yes. President Krill? Yes. Seven members. Seven members. Okay, and last one, 2019-062, add no rate on any Squanum Street eastbound intersecting with Hodges Ave from 7 a.m. to 8 a.m., 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. school days. I move positive recommendation. Motion made by Council Yang, second by Council Harris. Any discussion? Madam Clerk. Councilor DeBona? Yes. Councilor Harris? Yes. Councilor Hughes? Yes. Councilor Liang? Yes. Council Mahoney? Yes. Council McCarthy? Yes. President Kroll? Yes. Seven members. Seven members. Thank you, Councilor. Uh, Councilor Harris from the Environmental Committee. Yes, we held a, a meeting this evening with a positive recommendation on the adoption of the five-year multi-hazard mi mi uh, mitigation plan, 2019-050 through 53. I make a motion for approval. Motion made by Councilor Harris to move approval, second by Councilor McCarthy. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Councilor DeBona? Yes. Councilor Harris? Yes. Councilor Hughes? Yes. Councilor Liang? Yes. Councilor Mahoney? Yes. Council McCarthy? Yes. President Kroll? Yes. Seven members. Seven members. The item is approved. All set, Councilor. Um, yes. Presentations of petitions, memorials, and remonstrance. I, uh, I have two. I'd um, like to take a moment and uh, keep in our thoughts and prayers uh, the Alexander family, obviously, and Alexander works uh, for the city council in the city council office, the passing of uh, her mom, Evelyn Fernald. We certainly uh, continue to keep the Alexander family in our prayers. Um, and also uh, take a moment and keep in our prayers uh, the Kenevy family. Uh, Liz Kenevy um, recently passed away. She was a lifelong Quincy resident graduated of North Quincy High School, uh, raised uh, you know, two boys and uh, is a lifelong Quincy resident. So certainly keep uh, in our thoughts and prayers in this tough time, the, uh, the Kenevy family. Councilor DeBona. Thank you, Mr. President. Just um, uh, April is Autism Awareness Month. Uh, just keep it in mind. And tomorrow is April 2nd, which is Autism Awareness Day. So. Just keep it in mind with the uh, the, the kids and adults on, uh, that have autism um, and uh, to light it up blue this month. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Um, any other petitions, memorials, and remonstrance, uh, motions, orders, and resolutions? Okay, everybody's favorite part of the meeting. Scheduling of committee meetings. We will be back in this room Wednesday April 3rd for a finance committee meeting on the $61 million downtown incremental financing uh, request. Um, I know Jen, thank you Jen Manning for kind of compiling our schedule over the next month or so and sharing it with the city council. Um, I believe Council Mahoney was going to schedule an education meeting. Council Mahoney. On April 18th, if we could schedule an education meeting. Um, let's say 6.30, 6.30. Perfect. All right. Do we have a quorum? Because there was three councils that weren't available that week, and I think they're all on the committee. Uh -huh. it's really vacation week. That's why we moved Oh, it's vacation week, yeah. Oh, is it? Yeah. 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 Oh. That's, I know Council Leanne is not available. Maybe Council McCarthy. Yeah, Council Calvary is not available. Okay. And that's three. And What's the three. advertising on that? 48 hours. 48 hours? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Maybe we can work through that offline? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. No worries. No, Thank you for your willingness. No I appreciate it. Um, so we have obviously a whole lineup, if you will, of downtown meetings throughout the month of April. I had also shared with uh, you know one of the chair women for uh, for the ordinance committee that if there was uh, you know a need through the city council that we could always uh, utilize April twenty second in some form or fashion to continue the deliberations uh, regarding all things downtown, particularly surrounding the, uh, the Ross lot. Any other scheduling of meetings outside of that? Council Yang. Thank you. I just want to, I want to take the opportunity to take um, one of the Monday meetings from the regular council meeting on May 6th. 
and schedule a 630 ordinance committee meeting to um, get an update on the two orders we have around marijuana. So it'll be May 6th, 630? Yes, please. 630. All right. We'll kind of put a bow around this and reiterate to everybody sort of the next month of what it looks like. As we all know, this time of the year, uh, things start to pick up. So um, any other scheduling of meetings? Everybody's good? With that, I would entertain. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn, so moved. Close the city council meeting at 825.